And I'm fing pissed. I'm fing pissed. I like this movie. But I'm fing pissed. Hardcore 1979. The funniest movie cover you could ask for. It's genuinely hilarious. I mean, if we're talking clickbait, 10 out of 10. Who's not reaching for this movie? Like the cover I got, ugh. Life doesn't always go as planned? It just looks like a cheesy action flick that'll have a tit or two. Oh my God, this is my door. Funny enough, he never says this in the movie. Hardcore is a crime drama starring George C. Scott, which sounded familiar. And that's when I realized, oh, that's because that's basically The Exorcist 3. The same thing. Fat review on that. I mean, they're obviously very different films. Like Pazuzu, definitely lacking in the breast department. Beautiful Grand Rapids, Michigan. Is that even true? It, it doesn't sound true. George C. Scott plays Jake Van Dorn. I would say off name alone, that's a miscast, but he does a solid job. His daughter goes missing, so he hires a private detective to help him out. And what he discovers is a world he could not even fathom. So Jake obviously talked to the police first, and she was last seen with a man at a farm in California. She was there at a camp with her friends and nobody knows where she went. And the police just kind of tell him, yeah, this happens, man. Like we lose like a lot of people. You wouldn't think so, but. There's a lot of people not coming home tonight. I don't know, we'll keep an eye out. Obviously why he hired a private detective, his name is Mast. In fact, the police are the ones that told him to hire a private detective. Just fully acknowledging, yeah, I don't know, man, we're, we're kind of fucking useless. Those fucking barrels. Like if you're a bro, ignore if you're a barrel. Now Jake is a religious Midwestern man who owns his own business. He's got all the Jesus decorations in his house. You know, he's got like the big text cut out that says, this family is blessed. You know what I'm talking about. It's quiet out there. He doesn't give a damn about movies or TV. He just thinks they're all sinners in Hollywood. A truly, truly bigoted thought that just happens to be correct. So what Mast is about to tell him, better yet show him, is gonna rock Jake's world. It's gonna be the equivalent of basically taking a frying pan to his temple. But hey, who needs a frying pan anyway when you got today's sponsor? I'll keep it brief, I'm not a boxer. I don't burn cows at a criminal rate, gotta watch what I eat. Factors are sponsored, a factor why I'm steady dropping the weight. I'm calorie conscious, protein plus. I'm being honest, I'm more leaned up. Now food isn't all but a hell of a start. I ate good, now I jog in the park. They got the options for all of your needs. It's time to glow up, gotta watch the degrees. I'm a customer, I'm custom with ease. I'm getting winded, but when is a breeze? Fresh never frozen meals. Yeah, heat them up in two minutes. Cheaper than takeout meals. I'm eating good within my limits. Yes, I am a Factor customer. Straight to my door each week. Super convenient, delicious. Head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code MrGG50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. And thank you, Factor, for sponsoring this video. So, Mass takes Jake to an adult film theater and. Yes, his daughter's in the film. Oh my God, that's my daughter! He doesn't say it, I'm telling you. And this is supposed to be a disturbing realization concerning the whereabouts of his daughter. The weirdest bittersweet moment. Oh my God, she's alive! But I'm watching her work two shafts like a fucking crane operator. I can't watch this, but I can't look away. He sits there for like 80 seconds until he finally tells him to turn it off. And the scene just plays out way more goofy than intended. Here's a question. Why didn't you just tell me? This guy has photos of the film that he shows him. Why couldn't we start there? Or maybe just play the beginning. Hey, is that her? Yeah, that's her. All right, no need to continue on. I'm gonna take a wild guess where this Shyamalan tale goes. Let's just talk. I mean, it's weird for me to expect a specific emotion from Jake in this moment, but I would assume like anger, urgency. Like as soon as he realizes it, just runs straight at the mass yelling, where is she? Where, where, what do you know? But there he sat. He fucking stays for the after credit scene and then gently walks into the room, not an ounce of urgency in his demeanor. Mass tells him he bought the flick in a random store in LA, but there's no way to track anything about it. It's a dime a dozen porn flick, but he'll keep investigating. Mast obviously knows a lot of people, so he talks to a big shot in the porn biz, Billy. But Billy denies knowing who the girl is. Says he wouldn't mess around with that underage stuff. He's got dimes on his payroll, check him out. And Mast just then pulls over to enjoy the show. At this point, Jake's already planning to do some investigating of his own, so he goes out to California. He goes to meet up with Mast to talk turkey, but Mast is busy trying to bang one of the girls on set. Jake's obviously a little peeved because he pays the guy weekly along with extra expenses, so he kicks him out of his own apartment. This movie takes itself seriously for the most part. And there's also cheesy just 1979-ness in the movie. So there's a couple times where I just had to pause and be like, 
That was a joke, yes. <laughs> That's a good one. Jake hits the streets and he sees all this fun stuff. Strip clubs, peep shells, massages, call girls, sex shops, tattoo shops. The devil's den is open and Jake forgot to take his shoes off. Remember, Jake doesn't know anything about this world. So his investigating is asking random sex shop cashiers where he could find this girl. You can imagine the responses. He goes into another building and there, the front desk offers him, quote, nude body to body contact on a bed in a private room. Anything else he may want will be discussed in the privacy of their room and tipping is allowed. All right. It seems legit. He's caught off guard when trying to ask them about his daughter, so he just leaves. But the movie treats us like a couple of wads because we watch two Mexicans come in and signal this to show us that, oh, oh, that's what they meant. Gross. For 20 to $30? That's just downright affordable. He goes into another building and it's the same exact thing basically. You would think he's just horny at this point, but he's just a bit of a dingus. The girl offers the same and this time he takes it so he can talk to her in the room. She's suspect that he's the feds, so she plays a little Among Us mind games and says, Pull out your cock. He doesn't know how to maneuver this situation, so he gives her money and starts asking questions, but she's just still trying to do her job. He blows his top in the bad way and starts demanding to talk to the owner. This part's also kind of silly. Her name is Chris Nassau. you never seen her. Why'd you go out there? Shut up! Oh, gosh, how's that for so he sort of halfway forces, walks him all the way outside, throwing him into a few walls for good measure. And this is where Jake is ready for his Joker arc. He stops dressing like a stiff and gets his Hugh Hef on. His first plan is to talk to Big Shot Billy to help finance a film where he could probably fish for the actors in his daughter's movie. Billy doesn't bite and respectfully declines. So Jake goes to the paper and puts out an ad for young males to start in a hardcore film. Prior experience is a must. Smart man. He goes to watch a set Billy's doing and at this point he's just learning names and lingo. His brother-in-law, that I haven't mentioned at all, but he was in there in the beginning trying to help him out. He tracks him down because he's worried about him, but Jake tells him to go back home and just tell everyone he's okay. And that normally wouldn't matter, but he leaves only to rehire Mass to keep an eye on Jake and protect him. The auditions start to flow in for Jake in his super sick disguise. He looks like Scruffy the janitor. He gets Michael Phelps, Dick Black, who claims racism for not being hired. That's his real name, by the way. I'm Big Dick Black. Apparently he says he can come 10 times in a day. I guess once for every year. He gets another guy who shows him his wang, and right when this plan just seems absurd, this lanky little Goldilocks walks through the door. The same guy from his daughter's video. Jake starts to ask some questions, brings up the girl, and the guy's like, wait, I'm down, but not with her. She was trash. She was chewing on my shit like rawhide. Thought I was floss. He tells him this guy named Todd worked her, and a girl named Nikki at a strip joint will know where to find Todd. Then Jake gives one last kick for good measure. There's no going back at this point. I'm like 89% sure that guy's dead. He gets to the joint and finds Nikki. They're in some peep show jail visit deal, which is interesting. Was that a thing? I'm assuming that was a thing, but... Gross. Jake gets her to agree to help him out and tells her he can pay for a week of her time to help him find Todd in San Diego. He books some hotel rooms before they head out. Nikki's ready to give up the cheeks. Jake says, no ma'am, no need. Just get some rest. She's obviously thrown off and eventually figures out that he's the father of the girl in the photo. She wonders about his wife and he tells her that she's dead. They have some banter over the next few minutes of the movie. They talk about faith. Nikki criticizes his, but in the effort to not have him be so negative. She also talks about this. You know, a lot of guys who can't talk to their wives or their girlfriends and they talk to me, and I make them feel better. I'm just like a therapist. What do you think I do, just suck off guys all day? And he does not respond, because he probably does think that. She starts to describe how she came up working in the industry underage, and she rounds out to a point to try and have them relate. Jake doesn't think sex is important, so he doesn't have it. Nikki also doesn't think that sex is important, so she just has it with whoever. He pushes the idea away as Nikki tries to get through to him, but he brings it back to his daughter. Nikki finds a connect who gives her some info on Todd's whereabouts. He's actually in San Francisco, so they head out there. It's here we figure out that Mass works directly with the cops. I guess it's just a hustle. He gets tips from them, but he works off the grid to keep the media off the cop's ass. And he now knows where to find Jake. Nikki manages a call with Todd and sets up an appointment for Jake, calling him a specialty customer. He's urgent about the meeting, but Nikki clarifies that it's her ass on the line trying to set this all up, so play by her rules. Back at the hotel, Nikki pokes around a bit more, asking if Jake has a house. His own land? Wow. And then theorizes the possibility of his daughter not wanting to come back. He's confused, but she calls him out online about his dead wife. Turns out she actually left him. Trouble in paradise. Apparently had to do with sex, go figure. Jake's so much of a straight edge, terrified of this world that's revolving around sex, that 
He couldn't eat a little butt to keep the family together. Nikki brings up her pimp, Granville, who mistreated her, starts to bring up a story, but he stops her again. And I like her next line. So I guess we're both fucked, huh? At least you get to go to heaven. I don't get shit. Mash shows up at the door. He walks outside and fills in Jake on the kid he beat up. <laughs> He's alive, but the cops don't give a damn. About the kid, that is. They'd rather stop Jake before he does something crazy. Like put an ad in the paper to see young man penis while dressed like Uncle Rico. Jake had heard the name Rattan from Nikki, and when he questions Mast about the name, he tells him he's basically the guy to go to for all the terrible shit in this world. He's a bad guy. Jake then questions him about Nikki. She know anything about this? Who, the whore? Ah, she's the victim. I'm a dozen. Jake in his grooviest shirt meets Todd and immediately recognizes his boots from the video. He questions him about Rattan and the certain things that only Rattan could provide. Todd denies knowing him, but he says he could probably help him watch what he's looking for. So he gets him a private screening. This part's a little off. There's info delivered that wasn't exactly known before. And then Jake also questions Todd if Kirsten is in the video, his daughter, and Todd says yes, so I don't know what Jake was expecting or not expecting, but he's taken to this private screening and he just watches a straight up snuff film where Rattan kills two people. Mass talks to Nikki and warns her that her pimp is looking for her, warns her that Granville can get her strung out again. Nikki tells him she never plans to see him again anyway, but Mass continues to belittle her efforts to survive without going back to the streets. She tells him that Jake will take care of her, but Mass makes a mockery of that idea. Jake arrives, kicks passed out and demands to know where Todd lives. Nikki refuses to tell him out of fear that Jake will actually forget about her after he no longer needs her. He then backhands her, demanding the location, and she gives it up. Then he does this. I won't forget you. Mass sees him leave and worries for what he's gonna do, so he rushes back into the room calling the cops, telling Nikki she has to tell him where he went. We cut to Jake showing up to this bondage facility that Nikki told him to go to, that apparently Todd is at. He goes past the front desk, seeing multiple sets used for films, and finds Todd. He reveals to Todd who he's looking for and who he really is. And the battle begins! We get a lot of super cool slow motion jumps through these paper thin walls, and then this geese starts beating the daylights out of Todd, throwing him down like 15 flights of stairs. He demands to know where Rattan is and Todd tells him he's right across the street. So Jake walks into another joint and calls out Rattan and sees Kirsten right behind him. Rattan tries to immediately fight and then scrams. He then runs into Mast, who evades a knife slash, kneels down, reaches for his gun, drops the gun at his ankle, fumbles it in his hands, then chooses to wind up his shot in a karate chop sweep with one hand, shoots into a busy intersection 30 yards out, and smokes him twice as he's running away, and Rattan dies as the cops show up. Incredible. Kirsten had ran downstairs and Jake finds her. She's afraid he'll hurt her, but he reassures her that he's here to take her home. But she didn't say that because of the mistreatment from the bad guys, but because she calls out her dad for being a shit dad. Not loving her, driving away all her friends, robbing her of her life. He drove her away. Nobody took her, she wanted to leave. It's just a really, really intense scene. Uh, but I cannot lie. This girl's acting. <laughs> you never gave a fuck about me before. You didn't. Yeah. Anyway, she calls him a cocksucker. Shit's crazy. He breaks down admitting his wrongs, his flaws. He didn't know how to show he loved her because he was never taught. His pride got the best of him. But she tells him once again to leave. He gets up slowly and says, Really want me to go? She says no, and then he reaches out his hand and says, Well, then you take me home. He pops her in a police car and then spots Nikki in the crowd. Nikki, maybe I. Maybe there's some way I can. He then goes over to Mass and says, Maybe you can do something for him, maybe money, maybe uh, go home, go, go. Nothing you can do. So he nods, gets in the cop car with Kirsten, and we get credits. What do you mean you're leaving? Are you joking? I'm fucking pissed. This movie was good till it wasn't. What a shit stained ending. I hated that ending. I wish I recorded myself watching it. It was just me yelling at my computer screen. Oh, it's over? You didn't help Nikki? Let's run down why this ending blows ass. Jake has a very clear character arc. He is a stubborn, selfish, shitty dad. Through his journey that changes. The factor most responsible for that Nikki. Nikki's the one constantly breaking down his walls, making him look at himself in the mirror. But he's such a bigoted asshole that he just often thinks, oh, what do you know? You 
suck cock. But she's persistent, even tries getting him to see that she's just a person too, not just a fleshlight with arteries. And she not only works on Jake from the inside, but she's also his partner in crime. She was the one that saw Todd with his daughter. She was the one that used her connects to find Todd. She put her neck out there to set up a meeting for Jake. If anything went wrong, she's dead, where Todd would have her on a stake. She then ultimately gave him Todd's exact location, which was another risk. Sure, it was after he struck her in the face, but let's not forget about this moment. I won't forget you. You fucking stupid piece of shit. She just got finished being harassed by this asshole who warned her about her big bad pimp looking for her that is actively trying to bring her back to a terrible life. You then smack her, but you reassure her. I'll be there for you. I'm just a little emotional right now. You understand. Not to mention, once you leave on your daredevil mission, Mast calls the cops, and the only way they can come assist you is if Nikki gives up the location to him, to the guy, the guy that was just shitting on her life. That's the guy who's asking. And guess what? She did. I wonder why. Maybe to help protect your sorry ass because she cares about you, Jake. She did everything for you. And once you got your daughter with your new outlook on life that came from somewhere, the best you have is this? Okay, maybe I, maybe there's some way I can. A fumble of words insinuating you actually don't wanna help her at all? Not even a thank you? How can I repay you? Seriously, not even a thank you. No, you go to dumbass Mast asking, oh, there's gotta be something we could do for it. This guy's a scumbag too. You know that. Did you even pay her the full cut that you promised? We never saw that. And let me address the critics in the room quickly. Bro, it's just showing that the streets are unforgiving. She's a victim, always will be. That's her predicament. There's nothing he can do. My ass and balls, there's nothing he can do. You're telling me he couldn't bring her back to Michigan with him? Have her stay in a spare room while she tries to get on her feet, figure things out? He couldn't give her some minimal job at the business that he owns? Nothing. You genuinely believe he could have done nothing. I didn't need them to fall in love at the end. That's not what I'm asking for. But if you're gonna do that and just have her leave, then just kill her. That way, at the end of the movie, there's no questions. And you also get some emotion out of me because I care about her. I'm like Jake. Maybe she dies somewhere in the rescue. Maybe the pimp shows up and then Jake has to make this split decision of whether to save Nikki or to save Kirsten. And then he kind of sort of tries to do both but then Nikki ends up dying because of that. And once the dust kind of settles, he mourns her. He holds her in her final moments, thanking her that he finally found his daughter because of her. And then Nikki's dying words are some little snarky Nikki words like, let's hope heaven hears me out, huh? <laughs> Something! No, it's either that or he helps her and we get the good ending. This ending sucks. There's no harsh real life lesson that justifies this. It's just bad. I'm not watching this movie again. I like the movie, and then I don't like the movie. It's like a fucking Game of Thrones thing. I'll watch it up until that point. Justice for Nikki, Jake sucks. And yes, I know. Apparently the director said that one of his regrets was the ending. I guess what was supposed to happen is that Jake never finds Kirsten and then finds out that she died in a car accident that was unrelated to the kidnapping porn stuff, which, Sure, I don't care. Maybe then we could have gotten some closure with Nikki because there would have to be some sort of ending there. Unless he gets the news and he's like, oh my God, this is my daughter. <laughs> As a great man once said, I guess we'll never know. Subscribe. If you guys enjoyed this video, please leave a like. It helps out a lot. Please subscribe. I'm trying to hit a million in 2023. I hit 900K recently. Thank you guys very, very much for that. It is fucking amazing. A phenomenal milestone. Could not have done it without you guys. Thank you very much. Here are my lovely patrons. They get Patreon monthly exclusives. Mista.gg. It is no longer in viz.tv slash Mista.gg or whatever the hell that link was. New merch drop, by the way. It's nice. It's very cool. Mista.gg. Just pop that in. Easy as pie, baby. And as always, I am Mr. Gigi, and I am out. <laughs>